Real estate investing is one of the fastest ways to grow your wealth. And inside of real estate investing, if you can find a project where you can add value, this is an amazing way to build your wealth very quickly. But if you think that happens easily and without its challenges, like it does on HGTV, you're gonna be in for a rude awakening. In this video, I'm gonna break down the five biggest challenges that we faced taking this single family dwelling and turning it into an eight unit boutique apartment building, how we overcame those challenges, and how you can avoid them on your next investing project. Hey, what's up? Darren Boros here. My mission is to help you reduce your real estate investing education time from months to minutes. Subscribe not to miss what's coming. I have over 20 years of experience as a real estate investor and over 10 years experience in the construction industry. And even with that amount of experience, there are still challenges that we face on every single one of our projects. And you'll face challenges too as an investor and how you deal with those challenges is what's going to separate you from other investors out there. So here are the five challenges we faced on this project and how we dealt with them. Number five, the fire exits. In this building, because we have a shared entrance for four of the units, we had to find a secondary means of exit for those units. What that means is that when there's a shared entrance, each unit has to have a dedicated exit that somebody can get out in the case of a fire. And planning out those entrances and exits can be very challenging to your design. In our case, our original architect wanted to put in a scissor staircase, which was going to take up a lot of room on the interior. We decided against that and we decided to put in an individual exit for each unit. The only way to do that was to put it on the exterior of the building. So right here you'll see the pegs sticking out the side of the building where the fire exit will eventually be. But these exit staircases need to be built out of steel, which takes time to fabricate. It's very expensive and it takes time to install. So here's my tip for you to have to avoid using a secondary means of exit. If a rental unit has a dedicated entrance, meaning it doesn't share an entrance or an exit with any other unit, it doesn't need a secondary means of exit. So anytime you can, try to provide a dedicated entrance to your rental suite, and that way you don't have to have a secondary means of exit. Challenge number four was figuring out our heating and cooling systems for this building. Behind me, you'll see the ductless splits that we're installing for cooling. These units happen to also do heating as well, but that's not the primary heat source for this building. The primary heat source for this building is radiant in-floor heat, which means that we have radiant pipes running all the way in the floor, and there's a thin layer of cement poured on top of that, and those radiant heat pipes will provide heat for all of the units. The good thing about this system is that because each unit can be individually controlled by a thermostat, tenants can control their own heating and cooling. The downside to this system is there's no way to separate out the gas meters for each individual unit. So we, as the landlords, pay for heating in the home. One of the ways you can get around this is you could have an individual boiler in each unit, but this gets very cost prohibitive. My tip for you is find heating systems where you can separately meter everything so that your tenants pay for their own utilities. Challenge number three on this project was hydro. We took this building from 100 amp service up to 400 amp service because we have eight units in here and so we need 400 amp service to service all of those stoves, washers and dryers and everything else that's happening in this property. And the challenge with 400 amp service is that generally that requires underground service here in the city of Toronto as opposed to overhead, which is much easier and much less expensive. We also were plagued by delays by Toronto Hydro, which has a bit of a monopoly here in Toronto and we can't go with any other service provider. So we're really at their will as to when they were gonna come out and upgrade the service. So my tip for you is if you can, I would try to avoid having to upgrade your electrical service. If you can go with solar panels, gas appliances, anything you can do to reduce your electrical load is going to help you so you don't have to go and wait for months and months and months to get your electrical upgraded to these larger systems. The number two challenge that we had on this project was labor shortages. We had people commit to doing work on our projects and then they just wouldn't show up for months at a time. Where I'm standing right now was a giant hole in the ground for almost four months. The contractor came, excavated for the walkout, and then they just didn't show up for months at a time. We kept calling and then they would show up for a day, do some work, and then they'd be gone and they wouldn't show up for another couple weeks. And this process went on for months and months and months. Now the problem with there being a giant hole in the ground is that this becomes a major hazard for your project and anyone around your project. And so when Enbridge Gas came by the property and saw the gas meter sitting in this giant hole, they immediately shut the gas off and made us pay to have the gas disconnected. That cost us almost $4,000 and that was the final straw for that contractor. We fired them, hired somebody else and got them in very quickly to finish the work and get this 
hole turned into a walkout for this basement unit. So my tip for you is do not wait for people to show up for your job site. If you've hired somebody and they haven't shown up for weeks at a time, fire them and find somebody new. It's also very important that you structure the way you pay people so that there's incentive for them to keep working on the job. And at least if they don't show up, you're not out a bunch of money that you've already paid them for them to complete the work that they're never going to complete anyway. And the number one challenge we faced on this project was the pandemic. We didn't expect things to take as long or cost as much as they did in this project. And although we built in contingencies of 10 to 15% on budget and time, it just wasn't enough. I'm not sure how many pandemics you're going to have to deal with as an investor in your lifetime. I've only ever had to deal with one. So we really didn't know how to deal with this situation as it came up. But this is why it's really important that you build in these contingencies for every one of your construction projects. The level of your contingency should be based on your amount of experience as a real estate investor. If you're relatively new to being a real estate investor, I would say you want to budget 20 to 30 percent overage on time and materials. If you're more experienced and we're in regular times, you should be able to get away with a 10 to 15 percent contingency budget on your renovations. One of the things that has helped us during the pandemic is that real estate prices have been climbing at the same rate that labor and materials have been climbing as well. So they almost balance each other out. But that's not something that you should be relying on in your projects is that the real estate market is going to continue what it's done in the past. So now I'd love to hear from you. What are some of the challenges that you faced on your projects and how did you overcome them? And what is your tip for people to be able to avoid that problem in the future? You can leave those in the comments section below along with your real estate investing questions that you have for me. You can also follow me on Facebook and Instagram where I post regularly. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you on Tuesday.